Then there is uh, Eric Minical and Sonia uh, uh, and Sonia Vela. And, and I first met Eric because he applied to the graduate program that I lead, a PhD program funded by the National Human Genome Research Institute. And then we admitted him, and then after um, he told me why he had gone to the program, I immediately fired him from the program and told him to go uh, elsewhere because he had a very, it turns out he's very well trained in data science, and even though he was trained as a, he was, his job was city planner, and his wife was trained as a lawyer, I believe, for some reason they're both now graduate students, but with a very singular mission that I'll let you, uh, I'll let them tell you about. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Um, so I'm Sonia, and this is Eric. Um, we're on a joint personal mission to uh, facilitate the development of therapeutics for human prion diseases. Um, and uh, like many people in this room, um, our, our lives sort of brought us here in an unexpected way. Uh, so I'll, I'll just spend a moment telling you how we got interested in this subject. Um, in uh, 2010, I lost my mom. Her health turned on a dime. She went from healthy to dying on a time scale of days, and she went from first symptoms to life support in six months. Um, what we saw was rapid neurodegeneration. I had never imagined such a thing, um, and it was undiagnosed until after her death. Um, so from autopsy, we learned that she had died of a genetic prion disease, and these are dominant genetic diseases. Um, we reviewed some old uh, you know, rusty biology from our high school and college years and realized I was at 50-50 risk, uh, decided to get me tested, received a sort of fateful document telling us that I had inherited the mutation from my mom, and then set about trying to figure out what this meant for us. Um, nothing good. So prion diseases, in addition to being dominant um, in their genetic form, they're also highly penetrant. So my mutation is extremely likely to cause almost like 100%, we might say, to cause a midlife onset uh, fatal genetic disease, exactly what we saw in my mom. Um, average age of onset is in your 40s, maybe around age 50. Um, and these are currently completely untreatable diseases. So um, that's, that's a little background on prion disease. And um, you can imagine us sort of reeling as we receive this information. Um, and then what unfolded from there was sort of a, a series of life changes that I don't think either of us could have predicted. Um, at this point in life, we were in totally different careers, non-biomedical. Um, I was trained as a lawyer. Eric was trained as a city planner and engineer. Um, but we started reading up on these diseases. We started attending night classes. We founded a research nonprofit. Eric started a scientific blog. One thing led to another. We switched to jobs in science. Um, three and a half years later, we're now both PhD students here at Harvard Medical School, uh, not in Zach's program, as he referenced, but in a program where we hope to be able to do um, therapeutic research, and we're devoting our research careers to working on treatments and cures for these diseases. Um, so, so that's us. So um, I guess I'll note a few things that, um, that we're grappling with that are you know, specific to our disease. Um, these are pretty rare conditions, so on the great log axis of how rare a disease can be, we're probably a couple orders of magnitude more common than NGLI1 deficiency and a few orders of magnitude more rare than multiple myeloma. Um, since the U.S. started collecting data in 2000, there have been under 400 cases of genetic prion disease reported in this country. Um, so we do struggle with um, you know, getting enough data for natural history, getting enough patient specimens to find biomarkers, um, figuring out how to recruit enough patients for clinical trials. And even if we had 100% participation, some of the big data dreams that people are exploring in more common diseases um, would probably not be achievable for us. Um, and there's also the interesting fact, uh, so participation is not 100%, and that's in part due to the interesting fact that what Sonia has is a genetic diagnosis without a phenotype. She's perfectly healthy right now, and people with these mutations will be healthy for, you know, four or five decades before they very suddenly get sick and die. Um, and the fact that you don't have a phenotype offers you the opportunity to choose to keep this a secret. And many people do, due to stigma about genetic disease and sort of generally the, you know, the fact that these are untreatable. People will say, if there's nothing I can do anyway, then why would I get tested? 
Right, so this like returns us to the theme of what is actionable, what is not actionable. And obviously we've gone in a little bit of a different direction with this, um, with, with the sort of guiding philosophy that this must be actionable in some way, even if we're not at a stage where it's treatable. Um, and we've, uh, this sort of ties into a lot of themes that have come up already today, but I mean in terms of privacy, um, we've, I guess, sort of made ourselves guinea pigs in the sense that we're, we're not hiding from anybody. We're not hiding from the people in this room, not from my uh, insurance company. Um, and in fact, if you Google me, you don't even have to click on a link to see that I have this mutation in this gene. It's, it's really out there. Um, and I will say, like, this was part of, as was referenced earlier, sort of a cost-benefit weighing that we did. Like, can we sort of, like, help contribute to this area by being completely open with this information? And is that benefit maybe greater than, than the costs, which are a little nebulous and, you know, a little bit opaque? It's hard to say what they might be, but let's go for it. And I would say we've been able to rally great support and so far have not experienced, you know, negative consequences from this. That's uh, true at, at this moment, and who knows what lies ahead. Um, in terms of like the openness of the patient community in general, um, I think we're seeing some, some trends in the right direction um, as sort of social media takes off and people have changing attitudes towards privacy in general. Um, also as some reproductive options are sort of coming online. So you can now do pre-implantation genetic testing of embryos in conjunction with IVF. That's sort of like the first quote unquote like directly medically actionable thing you can do with a genetic test report like mine. And as these things become available, we're seeing people sort of leaning towards wanting to identify themselves to researchers, to their physicians, to us. Um, but I think the sort of like culture and history of stigma, shame, fear, paranoia around a genetic diagnosis like this one kind of can't be overstated. It's like a powerful force that we're trying to fight against. And I, what I wish more than anything is that we could offer people um, a, a culture that celebrates their contribution um, sort of in, in proportion to, you know, them willing to come forward and offer themselves. These, these are like it's not a large number of people, and each one is such a meaningful contribution to the research that can be done, to the clinical trials of the future. And I, I want them to feel celebrated, rather than um, having to make the much weaker offer of like, well, you can take a leap of faith like we did, and in a way that's a bit abstract right now, it could pay off for you, and you might get that warm, fuzzy feeling, and someday we might have a treatment. Um, so it's, it's a very sort of uh, tricky undertaking, I would say. Yeah, so I guess things, things are evolving in the right direction, even if it's been a gradual evolution. Yeah. And now as patients turn scientists, we've also had the chance to see some of the impact that having patients involved has on researchers. Um, and it's been, a, it's, very, it's been a very positive picture. Um, there's a lot of people studying prions, but there's only a handful that are thinking seriously about what it takes to develop a drug, especially if that means all the way from how do you design an assay at the molecular level to how do you recruit patients and design a clinical trial. So we view it as our duty to be the ones, and hopefully not the only ones, but the ones who think about that entire arc and try to bridge between those things. Um, and researchers have responded you know, amazingly to us. We've been really welcomed into the community, and um, people don't see us as competitors, is, is the amazing thing. So even when um, you know, two groups that normally view each other as, as bitter enemies or competitors and don't work together, um, uh, they will still be willing to, to be involved in things with us because they know our motives, um, and they, they just don't see us as competitors with them. So. Yeah, so that's like some really positive stuff we're seeing on the research side. And then on the, on the clinical side, in terms of delivery of care, like we're in a different position than some other diseases uh, discussed today in the sense that there's no care to deliver. Uh, not right now. And obviously we'd love to change that and we really hope to. Um, and so that has a few different effects on the landscape. Um, it makes patients less motivated to come forward. And I think it also makes uh, physicians less likely to prioritize prion disease as a diagnosis. If someone shows up with a rapidly progressive dementia, there's, there's literally a list of things to check for first because you can do anything at all about them. Um, so a, a big goal that we have is to get prion diseases onto that list. 
even if the first intervention that one can, can imagine is you know, very likely to not be a cure, if we have anything disease modifying, I think that will sort of like shift both halves of that equation. It'll make patients more motivated to come forward. It will make uh, doctors more likely to tap into the uh, rapidly improving diagnostic tools for prion disease. Um, so that is sort of our, our optimism about the future is that putting that, that treatment piece, the very first treatment piece on the table could be a game changer. Thank you.